Testing. Um, our first speaker today is Ruben. He's speaking uh, about the continuous delivery using blue-green deployments and immutable infrastructure. He is the founder of megacloud.com, and prior to that, he helped uh, start several startups become multi-million dollar companies in their uh, respective markets. He's a member of the advisory board of Create IT. Uh, please make him welcome. Hi, everyone. You know, just the Linux code just got started. You know, for me, this is one of the events of the year. And I'm pretty sure that this year it is going to be really, really awesome. Look, I am proud of uh, being able to show with you and to share uh, my experience doing continuous delivery. So let's get started. Well, when we are maintaining applications, we are making deployments all the time. And deployments, when you make a new deployment, it has a lot of risk. There are many things that can go wrong. From the infrastructure point of view, server point of view, human point of view. I remember once when we are making one deployment and we were in the middle of the deployment and suddenly we realized that the application was using a lot of RAM, more RAM memory than it used to use. And it wouldn't scale. We tried to work around it just to, be, to see if we were able to find and fix the problem very fast. But very soon we realized that that just was not possible and we had to roll back. And then we found the rollback failure. Somebody modified the database in a way that rolling back was not easy anymore. The traditional thinking states that we should apply the deployments within the same infrastructure, in the same servers. But experience tells that you will find problems. Now, with the cloud and all the flexibility that the cloud provides, we can do so many new things. And that's why, if you are able to perform blue-green deployments and also using immutable infrastructures, your deployments are going to be much safer. But what are blue-green deployments? Blue-green deployments is a deployment technique that reduces the downtime and the risk by running several production environments at the same time. So, if we have our application, which it is currently running the version 1.0, and if we are in a proper infrastructure, we will have some other elements surrounding those servers. If we want to make a blue-green deployment, and we want to deploy the version 2.0, what we will do it is to create from scratch a new set of servers. Here, we are in a very good position, because now we can test the new version in the production environment. If we feel that the new version, it works properly, we can switch the load balancer and all the traffic to the new set of servers. If something goes wrong, we can roll back by, by modifying the load balancer and sending all the traffic to the previous servers. And we know that that will work because it is exactly the same set of servers that we have been running before. Once we are done, we just destroy the infrastructure that we are not going to use any longer. But we have to remember the past. We have to remember where are we coming from. And those horror histories that if you've been in the market and you've been working for enough number of years, you will probably have lived. For example, when you just arrive to a company and they have this server, yeah. This server that has been running for many, many years. And this oral history has two versions. The version 
where the DAP server has been upgraded all the time. And many different people upgrade different bits. And sometimes they did workarounds when we were making the upgrade. And now it is absolutely impossible for you to replicate the state of that server. But there is another possibility. This server that has never, ever been upgraded. And you are really scared of upgrading the server because you don't know what will happen. That's why immutable infrastructures will solve this problem. Immutable infrastructures, it is a pattern for managing services where the infrastructure, it is divided between data, which is the part that changes in time. It is mutable. And everything else. Everything else is subject to be replaced with every single deployment. Nowadays, there is a lot of talk about Docker and containers. If you are using Docker containers as it is recommended by the open source community, one of the rules that you will be following is that you should not store information in the container. If you don't store information in the container, it does not change in time, which makes the container immutable. And if the container is immutable, it is very easy to implement blue-green deployments. If you are using Docker in that way, you are using immutable infrastructures. But Docker is not required for, to use immutable infrastructures. If you are using standard virtual machines, you can still accomplish the same goals. But one of the goals here is to be able to achieve the blue-green deployments using immutable infrastructures. If you do that, there is two simple rules that you have to follow. Rule number one, you are never ever going to modify the infrastructure. Whether if you want to modify a parameter of one of the services that you provide, or you want to deploy new, a new application, or you want to upgrade some part of the system, you are never going to modify the infrastructure. You will always create from ground up all the infrastructure that serves the application. And there is a good reason for this. Normally, if we don't touch it, we don't break it. So it is very safe. You will have all the times the old infrastructure that we know that it is operational, it is working, and we will have the new one that we expect to be in the same state. And obviously, you need to convert all the infrastructure into code. And you have to have the technology that allows you to recreate the whole infrastructure very fast. If we follow this, there is a set of advantages here. The first one, rollback is possible and easy. And the procedure to make the rollback happen, it is all the time the same. And obviously, it should be automated. The second one is that it avoids configuration drift. Well, if we have two servers that are supposed to be the same, well, chances are that the servers are going to start to be different in time. It might be because of different reasons. There might be one person that access to one of the servers and he has to debug something. So it will install software to allow him to debug. Well, the configuration now starts to be different. But when he installs that new software, it might trigger upgrades in other different packages. And that will make the servers even more different. 
And if you are more strict, and you say, OK, nobody goes to the server and does anything manually. We always run through the configuration management system. That still happens. Because the configuration management system can run on different times. And the packages version that the server has might be different. What is the impact of the configuration drift? Well, we have our application that it is running in two different servers that are supposed to be the same, and in one of them has problem, and in the other one it hasn't. Well, if you use blue-green deployments, if you use immutable infrastructures, you will be recreating the whole infrastructure over and over again, and the configuration drift will be reset. The third advantage is that you have the technology to create a production-ready infrastructure within minutes. That means that you have the correct documentation about how your infrastructure works. And you know it works properly because you can reproduce it anytime you want. If you have your infrastructure as code, if you recreate the whole infrastructure from time to time, it will remove different problems. Imagine now, it is Saturday night, 3 a.m. Okay, you are the after hours person who is uh, responsible of the infrastructure. And now something crashed. Well, this person is going to go to the infrastructure and it is gonna fix the problem. He will log into the servers, modify a few files, Debug the problem, okay, everything is up and running again. But it is 3 a.m. It's unlikely that this person is going to move the changes now to the configuration management system. Uh, we will do it, you know, Monday morning, it's fine. And he forgets. Well, you just have a new ticking bomb in your infrastructure because there is a problem which it is not in the configuration management system and eventually is going to blow up. If you use blue-green deployments, if you use immutable infrastructures, you will be destroying and recreating the infrastructure all the time, which means that if that person didn't put the information in the configuration management system, you will find very fast that something is wrong whenever the next deployment happens, and you can fix it. And this enforce the culture within your IT team that a change is not finished unless the configuration management system, that code that represents the infrastructure, is updated. This means that if we want to use this technique, we have to look at our infrastructure. And we need to analyze things that has no state. They doesn't change in time. We are not saving any kind of information. It can be replaced very safely. Such as resources, load balancers, images, auto-scaling groups, services, web server, application server. We also have to identify what part of our infrastructure it is mutable is going to change in time. We are not going to replace it with every single deployment, such as databases, SQL, NoSQL, file system. But we are going to have something else. There is going to be some other bits of our infrastructure which it is, has a volatile state. Sometimes it will have persistent data, and sometimes it won't such as message queues, task queues, email servers. Now, we are in our company, and we are going to make a new blue-green deployment. And at this very time, the marketing department, they say, OK, let's going to send a communication to all our clients, thousands of them. While the email, has, the email server has all those emails pending to be sent, well, you cannot destroy that email server right now. 
but eventually those emails are going to be sent. And the email server will have no queue. At that time, you can destroy the infrastructure. Obviously, there are no hard rules here, and every application, every company works in a different way. So let's look at the cage. If our application has a cage, which is very fast, and while it is warming up, it does not really affect very badly the performance of the application. Well, we can think of that cage as no state. It is immutable. We can replace it with every single deployment. However, if we have a cage that takes a long time to warm up, and while it is warming up, it really affects the performance of our application. Well, in that case, we might think of the case as persistent data, and we won't replace it with every single deployment. So, you have to have the technology that allows you to build from ground up the whole infrastructure. Well, on the left, we have a load balancer on the top that receives the traffic. On the left-hand side, there is an internal API using software-oriented architecture, and one of the things it does is sending email. In the right-hand side, we are using asynchronous programming. We have pinstalled D, which will store different jobs. The servers on the top, it will send jobs to be processed, and the server on the bottom right, they will consume those jobs. Sometimes it is not practical just to replace the whole infrastructure all the time. That's why you can define what is going to be the scope of this deployment. You might say, hey, let's just replace the servers that compose the API, which means that the load balancer and the email server are going to be shared between the blue and the green version. Or what we might say, let's increase the scope a little bit more. We can replace as well, within this deployment, the load balancer and the email server. And the more things we are running in parallel, less things are shared, the safer the deployment is going to be. This is a very interesting case. Imagine that you are working with asynchronous programming and you want to modify the format of the jobs. If you use the traditional thinking and you make the deployment in place, chances are that there is going to be a set of jobs that it is not going to be compatible with both versions and you might lose something there. But if you are using blue-green deployments, you will have two versions of this set of servers, which means that the old jobs will be processed by the consumers that can do it, and the new jobs will be processed by the new infrastructure that has the consumers that can also process it. The other thing that we can do is to integrate all this theory in a continuous delivery process. Let's review very fast how it works. Well, everything starts from the developer. Eventually, this developer is going to push some code to the version control system, such as Git or Subversion or any. If we are doing continuous delivery, this version control system is going to have some hooks that allows to send this code to the continuous integration server. And here, two things may happen. First one is that the test fails. Actually, this is pretty serious. We have a developer within our organization that he just broke the system. He was so lazy that he didn't even bother to run the test locally before sending the code. I think that this has to be punished. Well, something that I implemented in other companies that work very well, <laughs> it is a rocket launcher, which is a toy, and it actually fires. So you put this rocket launcher in the room where all the developers are. 
if someone dares to break the test, the continuous integration server is going to send a message to the rocket launcher. And the rocket launcher knows where everyone is. <laughs> so the rocket launcher will point to the person who broke the test, and it will shoot at him. Actually, this worked quite well, because eventually the people is so ashamed to be shot by the rocket launcher in public that they really started to take care about the unit test. Well, the second thing that might happen is that the test passed. And now, it, the question is, who triggers the deployment? If the trigger is automatic, we are talking about continuous deployment. If the trigger it is human, we are talking about continuous delivery. But the technology that you need, it is exactly the same. You have to be able to create from ground up within minutes the whole infrastructure. So I'm going to run a demo now. We are going to have a small application that runs under a load balancer in AWS. Obviously, in the real world, we, you will have more things around. What I am going to do is that I am going to modify a file. And I am going to push it to GitHub. GitHub is going to send a message to CircleCI. CircleCI is a continuous integration server. You can use Jenkins, Bamboo, it doesn't really matter. Then CircleCI is going to send a, manage, uh, a message to manage a cloud, which is an infrastructure orchestration framework. And Manage a Cloud is going to create the new version of the infrastructure. So let's do that. OK, this is the instance that we are running. We have uh, infrastructure version 59. And this one over here. It is our load balancer. And this is where the load balancer is. So let's have a look to it. And that's our application. So now. I am going to modify one file. OK, and now all the process is started. I am not a fan of showing progress bar to people, so I'm going to keep going to the presentation, and then we will go back to the demo. Well, when you are doing this sort of blue-green deployments, it's all the time the same. First, you need to identify which one is your deployment strategy. How are you going to switch between the blue version and the green version? You can do it DNS. You can do it from the load balancer. If you are using AWS, you can do it from launch configuration, auto scaling groups. If you are using containers, there is another bunch of techniques. Depending on the cloud, there is also some other techniques. Obviously, depending on your application, you have to think what is going to be the best way to do it. Then you need to identify what are the infrastructure resources. The infrastructure resources are those ones that does not contain the application themselves, but it is needed for the application to work. For example, load balancer, auto scaling groups, images. Then analyze the application. Are you using service oriented architecture, microservices? And what is the persistence? layer, which you are not going to modify all the time. And this takes us to, OK, what technologies 
do we have available in the market that will allow us to do the blue-green deployments? Well, we have three categories. Category number one are the ad hoc technologies. Ad hoc technology works very well for a single cloud supplier. An example is CloudFormation. You are going to be able to use all the tools that that cloud supplier offers, but it's going to be very hard, or it is harder, to try to use other open source projects or to use other clouds. Then we have the service wrappers. Service wrappers is the first approach to multi-cloud. We have the supplier API that offers all the functionality of the supplier. And the service wrapper is going to create a bit of code for every single feature. So you have it is available for you to use. An example of a service wrapper, it is Terraform. If you use a service wrapper, now you have access to more cloud technologies. But if the cloud technology is not supported by the wrapper, it is going to be very hard to use. And there are a second problem. There are some cloud suppliers, such as AWS, that makes new deployments and new features every single week. And if uh, for those features to be available to you, the service wrapper has to be updated. There is a third approach, which are the frameworks. Frameworks works in a different way. They use directly the different tools that the supplier provides in order to allow you to make all the automation happen. This makes the frameworks compatible with many, if not all, cloud technologies and open source projects. An example of this framework is the demo that we are running, which it is by Manager Cloud. Well, does anyone recognize this command? This is the command that you type from the terminal when you want to create a load balancer in AWS. And in this case, the framework approach, it hooks to the different command line interface uh, which are available. But if we are doing blue-green deployments, we have to create and we have to destroy. Same philosophy. This is a bash script that you will run. In this case, we just hook the AWS command line interface. The pair of creation and destruction, it is what we define as a resource. And the text on green, you can customize it. You can put anything here. This is the template about how to create a load balancer and how to destroy it. By the way, the load balancer name, it is hard-coded. In a real-life example, it will be a parameter. But now we have to create it. And that's why we have the infrastructure section. Here is where we say, OK, using that template, create a load balancer. But a load balancer is not going to do much. We need an instance. So we have the concept of role. And in this case, we are gonna run the, we are gonna run the role, which is called Tomcat underscore APP. Tomcat underscore APP runs a configuration called Java Demo. Java Demo is just a bash script. And it allows you to use Ansible, Puppet, Chef, Docker, Salt Stack, anything that you can trigger from Bash. In the framework approach by Manager Cloud, we make a difference between the automation of the infrastructure and the automation of the servers. They're completely split, and we think it is much cleaner. But the server and the load balancer is not yet enough. You need to be able to link those things together. 
we will use another resource, which it is called register LB. This resource needs two pieces of information. Number one, the load balancer name. The second one, the instance ID. And the instance ID, it can only, you can only get it when you are actually building the infrastructure. So that's why we have another section which are actions. And actions allows you to get on real time information about your infrastructure so you can finalize or anything you need. In this case, it will SSH into the instance and get the instance ID so we can register the instance. And that's everything you need to have your infrastructure automated. So let's go back to the demo. Should we finish by now? Yes, it is ready. We have the version. Yes, we have the version 60 here. If you remember our resource, it is executing the command line interface. This is the output of the command line interface. And the system knows that it is JSON. So you can actually parse all this information. Yeah. And we have here our new version with the hello Linux conf. So we have the two versions, the green and the blue. Now we're gonna get rid of the old, the older version. And now everything is cleaned up, the old infrastructure is gone. If you are doing blue-green deployments, there are two tasks that you are gonna be doing all the time. The number one, it is to create infrastructures, and the second one, it is to destroy infrastructures. I do work a lot with uh, web applications, and I do create two different scripts, the diagnostic script and the activity script. The diagnostic script, you can put it, for example, in a slash diagnostic. It, is, it tells from the application point of view if it is healthy. So for example, slash diagnostic in the front end. It will check, you know, do I have this library loaded? Can I write in this folder? But the front end is using an API. So it will call to the slash diagnostic in the API. In the API, it will do the same. It will start checking them in itself internally. Do I have access to this library? Uh, can I write on this folder? I am accessing to a database. Do I have access to the database? And if it says everything works, then you know that, it, that the infrastructure, it is healthy enough to work. The good thing here is that if you have a problem, you are going to be able to figure out very fast where the problem is. The second thing that we are doing is to destroy infrastructures. That's why we got the activity script, something like slash activity. You execute that in the front end, and it will say, well, uh, I'm not running any traffic, because if I am going to destroy it, I am supposed to not have any traffic at all. And because it is using the API, it will make a call to the API, to the slash activity. And the slash activity is going to check if it is ready to be destroyed. In this case, we are using a queue. So it will access to the queue, and it will check how many items do I have pending to process. And in this case, it is saying, OK, you have 10 items, so I cannot be destroyed just yet. 
Sorry, what, how long do I have? Ten. Ten? I've been running through this actually pretty far, fast. Well, I guess that uh, it is on the mind of everyone. Well, okay, this is fantastic. What happens with the persistent layer? What do I do with the database? The thing is that this is a pyramid. It depends on uh, you know, how often we make what kind of deployments. In the most of the cases, we will be modifying code. If we modify code, blue green deployments are good to go. Some other cases, we are adding new functionality. When we add new functionality, we tend to add columns to the database, to add new tables. If we are using SQL, we have some limitations. I and mean, it is a bit more complicated to do. If we are using NoSQL, the schema, it is much more open, and it makes things a bit easier. When you are modifying the database, you don't have to do it at the same time that you are making the blue-green deployment. You can actually do it ahead of, of, of time. Because those changes in the database are supposed to be compatible. The next type of deployment that we might do is where we modify the database. And this is less often, and this is a bit more tricky. So for example, we want to rename a column. Traditionally, we just go to the database and rename the column, done. Blue-green deployments has to be compatible, the old version with the new version. What we will actually do, it is to create a new column with a new version, with a new name. We make the deployment, we synchronize the information between the old column and the new column, and when we get rid of the old infrastructure, we just get rid of the old column. There is another set of deployments that we might do, which are more focused only in the persistence layer. If that is the case, probably blue-green deployments is not going to help you much, and you need to find other technique to do it. So that's pretty much all from here. So any questions? Hey, um, question about your last example. When you're creating a new column in the, data, the database for the new version of the infrastructure, mm -hmm. what can you do to continue synchronizing the state of the two columns, the old and the new? Presumably you have to put triggers in to try and keep the state consistent between the old infrastructure and the new infrastructure while you're running them. Do you view that as being outside of the problem, just something you have to do, or is that something you can manage inside this framework? Actually, uh, triggers, it is an option. I know that it is not viable in all the cases. So, the thing is, uh, blue-green deployments, it works very well for many cases. And there is a few of them that, you know, if we have a lot of interaction with the database, or the changes are focused on the database, they might become more complicated. So probably it is not going to be the only technique that you will use within your application to make deployments. I think that uh, there is no one solution for all the problems, and you need to analyze you know, what is your application, what is your case, what is your database, and if that makes sense or not. Because the best way to solve that particular problem, if you are using a SQL, a relational database, it is actually to use triggers or start procedures. Well, it's a trigger at the end of the day. Uh, hi. I guess you sort of touched on that just now, but actually my question was going to be, so what do you actually recommend um, for databases? Do you recommend full backups and then checkpoints? 
on production databases and then applying them to the new databases? Or can you just elaborate a little bit more? OK. Databases, uh, normally, the way you do the backups and the way you preserve the database so it won't get corrupt with the deployment, you can use exactly the same as whatever you are using now. Making a backup, it is always a good idea. Having backups, it is always a good idea. So it might be a technique that helps you out in order to keep the, uh, the, the data not corrupt. So yeah, this is what I actually would do. With your uh, framework approach, um, how do you cope with if you change cloud providers, you'll have to rewrite every piece of it to work with a different set of command line tools and things? Yes, please understand my limitations. I am Spanglish, so can you repeat again? Um, so with the framework that you've yep. you got, um, you've got uh, vendor-specific commands that you'd be running. Mm -hmm. If you wish to change cloud providers, in this case, you would have to rewrite all of your If you want to change the cloud, for example. Yeah. yeah, or they change the tool command line flags or something like that. Well, uh, normally, uh, this is just based on of experience. The different cloud suppliers, they tend to be backwards compatible. So yes, this is a risk that you might, you might have. But experience tells us that it is not really that important. But yeah, if the you know, cloud supplier decides, OK, now we're going to change the format of how you do something, you obviously, this is just a file that you will have under version control. Uh, that Mac file, the one that contains the infrastructure blueprint, it has a set of requirements, such as the command line interface. So it is good to have it linked to the version that it works. And if they change the format, then you just need, you know, just to make the update as you would do with any other software. Related, <clears throat> excuse me, a related question. I didn't quite follow you when you made the distinction between a service wrapper and, and the framework you suggested. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, the benefit you suggested was, oh, well, you're, you're not having to deal with uh, the service wrapper being out of date if new features are offered by your cloud vendor. But don't you have to do exactly the same work in your framework to keep up with new features? And so wouldn't it be better to work through a service wrapper where you're sharing the burden of keeping on top of the changes of the underlying API with everybody else? Which I'm trying to understand the difference between yeah. the service wrapper and your framework. There's obviously a key difference that you see there, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Okay. Imagine that you are you know, managing that service wrapper, OK? And you say, OK, I'm going to look to AWS, that they have such a lot of services, and we want to create some kind of common interface. Problem number one, when you try to do that common interface, you realize that different cloud suppliers are not that common, which means that at the end of the day, the wrapper, what it is doing, it is to create a set of code with it is custom to that particular cloud supplier. This is what happens in reality. That wrapper has to be created. That wrapper has to be maintained. And for if we have AWS that makes an upgrade every single week, and we decide, OK, we want to maintain 10 different cloud suppliers, and you find yourself with 10 different updates every single week. That is the second problem. The third problem is that as you dig on the different functionalities that those service wrappers offers, you normally find limitations. You go to do something very specific, and the service wrapper does not allow it. The framework approach, what you are just doing, it is to use the command line interface. 
And because of that, it's not that you can access to every single cloud supplier available in the market that has a command line interface, which it is basically all of them. It's that you can have access to all other open source projects that they are coming every single day. Because things move very fast. A couple of years ago, it was Docker. And next year, it might be something completely different. Let's say unikernels, which it is starting to hit hard now. And the, your service wrapper is not going to have access to manage that. If you hook the command line interface, which in the majority of the cases is maintained by the cloud supplier, you will have access to all that functionality that the different cloud suppliers offers. And whenever there is an upgrade happening and new features are coming in, you will have access to all those features right away. And if tomorrow there is a new technology that no service wrapper ever thought about that, you have the flexibility of being able to choose that if you decide to do so. So at the end of the day, okay, service wrappers, they work very well. But they have a limitation on flexibility, on things that allows you to do. If you use the framework approach, it does not have any connotations of if you are using this cloud or this other cloud. And at the end of the day, it's the flexibility that it provides to you. Does it answer your question? This will be the last question. I don't see you. Okay. Hi. Um, so it sounds like this is an alternative to staging environments and other sort of environments. Have personally, have you been burnt before by like having a staging environment that was not able to catch a problem in production? Is this perhaps why you're advocating for blue green deployments? Okay. So you, uh, if I understand properly your question, you are saying that the staging environment should be able to accomplish this goal, right? The blue-green deployments. Is that the question? Sorry, can you repeat over again? Sorry, because um, it seems like um, a lot of organizations will use a staging environment to attempt to catch some of these problems. And then um, it doesn't always work, right? Mm -hmm. Because the data is different. Yeah. And it is production-like at the yeah, end of the day. But then there are also some advantages of staging environments because um, it's, it's potentially easier maybe for people to QA these, mm -hmm. these things visually. So if you're making visual changes to a website that you, know, you don't have unit tests and stuff to cover that, sure. Mm -hmm. But personally, have you, have you been burnt by a staging environment not catching a problem? In the past? Yeah. Absolutely. And is this, so th is this the primary advantage that you see with blue-green deployments? Okay, blue-green deployments, what is going to accomplish is zero downtime. Okay, you are not gonna have any downtime ever because you have the extra layer of security, which it is to make you know, the both environments. Staging, staging, deploy, uh, staging environments, they are normally production-like, but they are never like production and you can find problems. This is obviously not meant to substitute the staging environments. That has to happen. But the blue-green deployments, it will allow you to capture some of the problems that the staging environment skip. So yeah. That's uh, all we've got time for, but thank you very much, Ruben. short break before our next talk. <laughs>